grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. How do you handle, rebuke, reprimand, reproof? How do you deal with the hard words from our text from Ephesians chapter 4? Let the thief no longer steal. Let no corrupting talk come out of your mouth. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away. Do you deny the accusation? I didn't do it. Do you defend yourself? I had a good reason for what I did. Or do you dissemble, put on a smile, and talk about something else? Deny, defend, dissemble, all good reasons to be thankful for the lectionary series that puts this reading before us this morning. Left to myself, I might just skip right over this section of Paul's letter. Why? Well, because Paul's words are strong, forceful, and they speak to the heart of an issue in me and in the congregation. Paul admonishes the Ephesians because they need it. I remind you of the last three weeks we spent with the Ephesians. They're a mixed group, Jews from Asia Minor and from Jerusalem mingled with Gentiles, the Goyim from every nation who knew little or nothing of the Jews in their Old Testament legacy. Likely there have been. There were heated and bitter discussions. Jews claiming a right by birth and by circumcision to Christ, to their Messiah. Gentiles wondering, who is this Moses? What does the Torah have to do with Jesus anyway? Our divisions are not primarily ethnic, but they can be just as acrimonious, just as bitter and sharp in language or tone. Listen again to Paul's reproof. Let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and slander be put away from you. There is an internal development to Paul's list, a growing crescendo that works towards a climax. It begins in bitterness. All bitterness, he says. It is an internal emotion. It ferments in the heart and poisons a person and his or her relationship it can lead to wrath. That sudden explosion when bitterness takes flight, closes itself in words and actions. Words spoken that cannot be retrieved, no matter our regret or actions. When we turn and walk away, creating physical separation that prevents reconciliation. When separated, our anger grows like a bitter pot of wrath left on the stove to simmer. It gets thicker and sticky and it reeks. But it is not just the pot of wrath that we and our enemies must deal with. There is the clamor, the noise of our conflict alerts our brothers and sisters in Christ that something is wrong. And alerts our neighbors out there, that outside our fellowship, that something is rotten in Denmark. You don't want to go there. And finally, slander, blasphemy in the original, mudslinging that leaves both parties sullied and soiled and saddened. You may recall the old children's rhyme, sticks and stones may break my bones, but names will never hurt me. Well, you and I both know that's not true. I suggested that the list ends, moves towards the climax, but really it ends in sorrow. Paul summarizes it simply, let it put away from you along with all malice. He's talking to us. How can we sit still? Remember where we started? I asked, how do you handle rebuke, reprimand, or reproof? Let's not deny it, Peter's move in the court of the high priest. Let's not defend ourselves, Adam's move in the garden. Let's not dissemble, Eli's move, when his sons misused the sacrifice. We Americans are eminently practical people. Our first inclination is to fix it. Just tell me what to do, Pastor, and we'll get her done. Too often, though, we end up treating the symptoms and not getting at the cause. For our bitterness, we want to walk. One like God showed Moses at Moran. You recall the story from Exodus chapter 15. Three days into the wilderness, the children of Israel came to Mara, but they could not drink the water because it was bitter. So Moses took the log that Yahweh showed him, and he threw it in the water. And the water was sweet. Sorry, God has not shown me any logs. For our wrath and anger, perhaps a time out. With our kids, it was, go sit in the black chair. 
For clamor, headphones. For slander, a muzzle. But we're just treating the symptoms, not the root cause. All too soon, they move back and they dock them with a vengeance. We're a little like Greg Hartsuff, only he ended up in jail. But he couldn't say that he wasn't warned. Beginning in 2000, city officials asked him to clean up his backyard. They took the matter to court in 2002 to ensure his compliance. Finally, on the 5th of July in 2007, the court gave Hartsoff 30 days to clean up the boats and crab pots, the vending machines, and other miscellaneous debris that littered his Maryland backyard. When he failed, the court sentenced him to 30, 60 days in jail. Hartsoff and his attorney insisted that he was doing his best. He had already hauled off four 30-yard dumpsters. Still, city officials were fed up. This cycle will keep going until the property is cleaned up, out of Tracy Reynolds, a county spokesman. The site would get cleaned a bit, and it got messed again. It was never brought into compliance. Neither will our backyard, our malice, be brought into compliance, treating the symptoms. Bitterness, wrath, anger, are all systems, symptoms, manifestations of our fallen condition. That's the purpose of the law, to make us aware. But after the law, once we are convicted of sin, then comes the sweet word of the gospel. So Paul speaks to the Ephesians. He speaks to us when he encourages, be kind to one another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another as God in Christ forgave you. Notice where he starts. Paul starts with right relationships. Bitterness, wrath, anger, etc. They all separate us from God and from one another. But God forgives. He forgives us in Christ Jesus and thus restores us to a right relationship with himself. And because we have been forgiven, we in turn are to forgive. There is, however, a difference between our forgiving and our Father's forgiving in Christ. Lenski observes that God cannot dismiss our sins in a summary fashion rationalistic view. If we can forgive without atonement, God can surely do likewise. No. Our sins against God are a different thing. We forgive each other as equals. We can and do wrong each other, but God, God has not wronged us. There is no mutual or corresponding debt. And there is forgiveness, but only in Christ, whose blood atones for our sin. In Christ, in his blood on Calvary's cross, as Paul reminds us in the opening prayer of this letter. In him, that is, in Christ, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses according to the riches of his grace. You are forgiven. Through the water of baptism, he washed you. He claimed you. He made you his beloved child. Which is why Paul encourages, do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. But it was not just then, 5, 10, 50 years ago, when the pastor made the sign of the cross on your forehead and upon your heart and trickled you with the water of baptism that you were forgiven. God continues to forgive you in Christ. As David so graphically expressed it in the psalm, as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his steadfast love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far does he remove our transgressions from us. As far as the east is from the west, just how far is that? The interesting thing about David's poetic simile, he doesn't say as far as the north is from the south. Why not? Well, David's cosmology, his worldview, is quite different from ours. But it was inspired. If you take a globe and put your finger on Tillamook at roughly 124 degrees west longitude and trace that meridian all the way to the north, eventually you're going to get to the North Pole, right? And if you keep following your nose, you'll be going south on the 304th meridian. Keep going, you'll end up at the South Pole and then back up on the 124th meridian back to Tillamook. North and south meet on a single longitudinal line. But try it the other way around. Instead of going north, go west, just above the 45th parallel where Tillamook is, and keep going west. Eventually, you'll come back to Tillamook. 
and keep going west again to Delmar. And keep going west. There is no place where going west you will lead east. So how far does David say God has removed your sin? Distance is infinite. You cannot measure it. That's how far east is from west. That far you have been. You are forgiven. Forgiven is more than just the past participle of the verb to forgive. It's a new state of being. It is who we are in Christ, but also who we are to one another. Paul summarizes this new reality when he tells us to put off your old self, which belongs to your former manner of life and is corrupt through deceitful desires, and to be renewed in the spirit of your minds, and to put on the new self, created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. Notice again that it centers on right relationships, especially in three infinite verbs, to put off, to be renewed, and to put on. Our English conceals an important insight in the original. The first and the last of those infinitives are in the aorist tense. We should translate them as singular past events. The old man or woman is put off, crucified with Christ, as Paul will tell us in Romans. He, she, cannot be renewed, but replaced by a new man or a new woman who is put on by the creative act of God. By contrast, the middle term, to be renewed, is in the present tense. We translate, we understand this as an ongoing activity. Yesterday I was, you were, renewed. And again today, you are renewed, and tomorrow you will be renewed. The difference in grammatical form corresponds to the difference between justification and sanctification. As forgiven children of God, justification, we take up the challenge of living out our new life in Christ, sanctification. Be angry, Paul writes, and do not sin. There is anger that is murder. Jesus was no murderer, and yet he was angry. Mark chapter 3. And he looked around at them with anger, grieved at their hardness of heart, and he said to the man, Stretch out your hand. He stretched it out, and his hand was restored. The key is to combine both commands. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your anger. When offenses occur, seek forgiveness, and then dismiss it. When anger flares up, almost always both sides have need of repentance and forgiveness. We have a God-given obligation, according to Paul, to be imitators of God as beloved children. Don't let your righteousness resemble a Garth Brooks song. When you bury the hatchet, don't leave the handle sticking out. Instead, heed Paul's advice. Be kind to one another. Tender hearted. Forgiving one another as God and Christ forgave you. Or as Luther's explanation of the fifth petition says, so we too will sincerely forgive and gladly do good to those who sin against us. Forgiven and forgiving. A God imitating life lived in light of the gospel. So I return to my original question. How do you handle rebuke, reprimand, or reproof? We ask for forgiveness, knowing that God forgives us in Christ. We hear the comforting words of absolution, then we forgive one another as we have been forgiven. Amen. Now may the peace which surpasses all understanding guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Good life everlasting.